Welcome to the Three Continents One History Radio Show. My name's Ebony. My name is Ancobia. Lovely. Last week we had a look at uh, setting the scene in Africa before the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. And we have to say, first of all, thank you so much for all the feedback that we had this week. We had plenty of people calling in to say how surprised, how empowered they felt by some of the things that we'd actually... Um, sort of shared with them and it was lovely to feel that feedback what, what were they saying to you Ancovia? out and about this week i mean i've had phone calls from people saying oh gosh i never knew our history went back so far i only thought that we were 300 years old i've had people say to me that they thought our history only began with slavery and generally people have been calling me left right and center how can we get hold of that documentary okay well this week it's the european expansion into Africa, yes, the European expansion into Africa. Very, very um, esteemed guest we have in the studio this evening. Very happy to have him on board with us. Good evening, Dr. Clive Harris. Good evening. Would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? Well, Jones? project director for the Three Continents, One History project, which looks at the role of Birmingham in the transatlantic slave trade. Yes, I'm a research consultant I work from of myself. My company is called HMD Research and Training, and I also have an affiliation with the Franz Fanon Research Unit in the ACMC, in the Africa Urban Millennium Centre, which houses New Style Radio. All right, let's get started with our interview. Which countries were involved in the transatlantic slave trade? Okay, I suppose my answer to that is going to be a very long one mm -hmm. because I would first of all say we need to define what we mean by involvement. Mm. I mean, okay, for this purpose, I shall define involvement purely as, let's say, sending ships out, establishing colonies in the Caribbean, establishing forts in West Africa. But I think there's a, another kind of involvement which would then involve other countries. If you take the argument that those ships had to be financed, that journey had to be financed, the goods had to be financed, then other countries like Switzerland become quite important in helping to finance that, in particular, Dutch side of the trade. Mm -hmm. Now, if we take the view too that in those days, you really can't speak of countries. Uh, today, we work through the idea of countries, mm -hmm. Britain, France, and so on. But in those days, you found soldiers, sailors who sail for other countries. It was the norm that if you would sell your service to the highest uh, bidder. So it's significant that Columbus was, in fact, Genoese. <laughs> he wasn't Spanish. Yeah. But yet he was sailing on the Spanish flag to conquer the Caribbean. But if we come back then to your question, mm -hmm. to a narrow definition of involvement as ships going out, goods going out, forts being established in Africa, then we can identify specific European countries who are in fact central to that. Initially, of course, the Portuguese and, of course, the Spanish. Later, the British, the French, the Germans, the Danes, the Swedes, the Norwegians, and places that we don't even hear about, in fact, have ceased to be exist on our European map. Places like the Duchy of Courland, which came to Tobago, which came to Gambia. Okay, the Duchy of Courland today is what we call Latvia. Right. So countries as far east as <laughs> Latvia, in fact, were already there because they had a significant merchant navy, and that was often a defining reason yeah, to become involved. Three continents, one history on New Star Radio. Last week yeah. we looked at the last of the three great African empires, ancient Ghana, Mali mm -hmm. and Songhai. Yes. Once Songhai actually fell, mm -hmm. how did Europeans view Africans? How do they now begin to view Africans in the world? I think it changes a lot because clearly the early travellers to places like Songhai and Mali spoke very highly of the, as you said in your programme, the universities, the learning, the fact that books were more important, yes. <laughs> as you said, than even other material objects. But Clearly, after the fall of Sangai, and in fact, it was really the last significant African empire. Of course, yes. you have other empires emerging, smaller empires, quite often coastal empires. And it's interesting because those were the ones that interacted significantly with the European involvement, were able to purchase goods like guns. And in fact, in your program, you touched upon how the possession of guns, or lack of it, was really what defined yes. the Sangai experience. Yes. With the European involvement, I think you have a significant transformation in the way in which African countries related to Europe, in particular in some kind of quite often subservient trade relationship. Mm -hmm. Yes, not necessarily on par. As a consequence of that, you know, of course, you also to have the shifting opinions of what Africans were or supposed to be like. It's as if Europeans then suffered a kind of an amnesia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they had forgotten all of those narratives. 
that toll of wonderful cities and so on, yes, in Africa, and of yes. course that becomes transformed into a very negative, hardened images of what Africans were like to be as savages and so on and so on, yes. So I think there's in fact, as you would say quite rightly, a shift in your opinion. It doesn't remain constant mm -hmm. and it shifts for the negative, I think certainly after the slave trade comes along. Okay, one of the first questions that springs to mind is why mm -hmm. go all the way to Africa to enslave people? I mean, did the Europeans ever attempt to enslave another nation perhaps closer to home? Yeah. Well, the slave trade, as let's say up until, I don't know what, when the Portuguese became involved, was very much a Mediterranean thing. Mm -hmm. And the Mediterranean slave trade involved all groups of peoples. Africans were there people from Eastern Europe who were there and it's significant that the word that we use for slave, slave, actually comes from the word that applied to the people from Eastern Europe, the Slav people, <laughs> yes? They were very prominent in the Mediterranean slave trade dominated by Arabs. Yes? And Slav is where we get the word slave from. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So in effect, a number of groups were already involved as you know, enslaved peoples along with Africans were only one of the few groups and some of these the others were of course white mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but of course they were seen as inferior Slav white peoples. New Star Radio 98.7 FM Birmingham's number one community FM So what, what went Africa so attractive to the Europeans? Well first of all we need to note that Europeans were already trading with African countries before the slave trade begins so there's already an established trade network <laughs> that the Portuguese were already and in fact the British too were already sending out ships to trade in uh, as it were gold ivory and other kind of African uh, commodities timber that couldn't easily be obtained in uh, Europe yes the mahogany that goes into making the wonderful kind of <laughs> as it were chairs and all those wonderful kind of things that you know that in European country houses they have to be imported and they're imported primarily of course from Africa there is to and perhaps we need to separate out here to Portugal and Spain from the other European countries mm -hmm. because these because of the Arab conquest of Spain had already had some familiarity, a degree, in fact, a large degree yes. of, of familiarity yes. with Africans, yes? Mm -hmm. So it's not a new thing, yes? In fact, it's actually been said that when you look at the, the Spanish experience in terms of what they went through with the African and Arab Moors, mm -hmm. that the, the Spanish and the Portuguese now would use the slave trade as justification to say, well, you came to our country, you colonized us for 700 years, now it's payback time. Yes, if you choose to elide Arabs with Africans. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yes. yes I mean, we, and we then have re entered the whole debate about the relationship between, yes, as it were, North Af Africans yes. Yes, and Sub Saharan Africa. Yes. Yes, because clearly we then have to go into the whole debate about the conquest of North Af Africa by the Arabs, yes? Are we still using that word, Klaus, Sub Saharan Africa? Well, I, I only use it in, in the sense to make a distinction between the point you made about people who live in the North of Africa <laughs> okay. in, and, and people who live. You know, who are who were okay. pushed out and of that and now live as well. Oh, okay. Yes. So I only lose it in that kind of loose geographical loose. sense. Do you think the Spanish had a some kind of an argument to say, Yes, you've colonized our country for seven hundred years mm -hmm. um even though they did good in, in Spain the most yes, they, yeah. they didn't, you know But they, they left a wonderful the legacy. Uh, they, they, they were the ones who in fact brought civilization to Europe. So yes. we shouldn't affect well, okay, quote unquote civilis civilization. They were the ones who developed mathematics, who in fact translated all of that Greek and Egyptian yes, yes. As, uh, as it were learning that had been lost in the European Dark Ages. They were the ones in fact who brought it back into so we okay, yes all dominations really have the pluses and the minuses yes yes, yes. so you talk about Spain and Portugal what kind of African nations were um, targeted and why what kind of nations do they go for okay well clearly West African nations really straight for like from Mauritania right down to Angola there will be Mauritania down to Senegal Gambia Liberia really there isn't an African country which has a coast and it, you didn't even have to have a coastal <laughs> border yes? Yes, yes because in fact slave raiding slave capture didn't you know, transgress all of those borders of you know of the countries that had didn't had no borders and countries with. My work has focused primarily on the West African experience, but of course, there are scholars who focus upon the East African experience. And in fact, I did some research recently on someone in Leicester who was in fact Ethiopian. So, you know, for some unknown reason, Ethiopians were part of that kind of slave trade, too. One of the things that's come out um, mm -hmm. in the recent commemorations. Mm -hmm of um, the abolition of the, of the slave trade. When you've been watching particular television programs yes. and documentaries, mm -hmm. they would tend to say um, that the Europeans never went interland. It was mainly yes. 
the Africans who was who, uh, bringing the, the people to the coast. Yes. But when you look at some of the evidence, for example, there's a book by Joel Barrow called mm -hmm. The Pageant of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And he talks about when he went into the interland, he saw the various flags of European yes, nations. Yes, absolutely. Stabbed everywhere. Yeah, yes. which kind of makes yes. you wonder, well, you must have gone inland. Yes. You must have gone inland to yes. meet the kings and, mm -hmm. and to meet the various peoples. So it's not altogether true that they just stayed on the coast. No, and the, they didn't just stay on the coast. Certainly, I think, in the early years, it was kidnapping that was the main vehicle for acquiring Africans. But clearly, that was too slow. It was too costly. And of course, both in terms of money and also too in terms of health. You know, Europeans often claim that they suffered tremendously from the African climate, yeah. as they did, in, in fact, from the Caribbean kind of climate. Yes. So that's why I think they were unable to acquire sufficient numbers because you would have to have treaties. You know, Africa wasn't just simply open territory. Yes. <laughs> there were countries already there. There were people there organized as countries, as empires, as kingdoms. You would therefore have to have numerous treaties <laughs> yes. that you would have to enter into to secure the, the requisite number of Africans that you would, in fact, need for the New World plantations. So then, by that do you mean that the Europeans were collaborating and not acting as separate um, nations in themselves? You know, was there an agreement, formal or informal, as to who got access to certain parts of well, Africa? Okay, I would say that there was collaboration at the start, collaboration at the end. Mm. <laughs> let, me, let me explain what I'm talking about here. The start would be the 15th century. And the collaboration is actually forced on. Well, the two key countries here then are really Spain and Portugal. And Spain and Portugal are effectively made to collaborate by the papal edicts, yes, that somehow allocate one half of the world to Spain, another half to Portugal, and says that Portugal has the trade on the West African coast. So Spain is in fact shut out by the nature of the two papal bulls of 1452 and 1455, yes, we can come back to those, yes? yes. But they define, I think, the nature of the slave trading experience as the early slave trading countries like uh, Spain and Portugal were entering and developing that trade. Now, I say that at the end, there's also a collaboration, and in the middle, there's just warfare. <laughs> okay, but at the end, I'm talking here about the late 19th century, mm -hmm. when Africa is literally being carved up by the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 between European powers as different spheres of influence as they realize that rather than fighting endless wars, <laughs> it's better that we in fact come together to carve up Africa. Now between that time, I would say between let's say 1660 and 1850, really what you have is quite often open warfare between European countries. So if you go to Ghana, a country like Ghana, you would find Okay, along the African coast you have some like 60 European forts, which are military forts, slave trading yes. factories, yes? Which were meant to be the connections that linked the Atlantic with the interior mm -hmm. of Africa. What you find in places like Ghana is that you can find a Danish fort a mile away from a French fort, away from an English fort, away from a, a Dutch fort, and of course away from a German fort. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> in, in just the same locality, trading with the same peoples, yeah? Three continents, one history. In fact, when you look at the Portuguese and the Dutch uh, situation, mm -hmm. um, when you hear them talk about um, Africans, you know, when the Europeans got to Africa, mm -hmm. the Africans were already at war with each other. Yes. That isn't always true, because if yes. you look at how the Dutch, for example, if they wanted to take a certain portion of what the, yes. the Portuguese had, mm -hmm. they would go over to a certain village and, and, and they would get them to fight against the, the various, absolutely. The various it's um, civil groups. war, you yes. foster civil war. Divide and rule. Divide and rule. That's when we need to look very closely at, in fact, the trade goods, because there are certain trade goods that allow that to happen, because, you know, going back to your program on Songhai, the fall of Songhai, the lesson that Africans learned from that <laughs> is that you had to acquire European hardware like guns and gunpowder, yes, to, in fact, defend yourself. And the Europeans are only prepared to sell guns if you're prepared to do in return. Mm -hmm. Yes, a number of things for us, like selling Africans as enslaved persons. Talking about selling Africans as enslaved persons, mm -hmm. there's a story of Kwame Ansa, who they say was um, the first person mm -hmm. that the Portuguese came across on the mm -hmm. coast. Mm -hmm. um, and the the Portuguese basically uh, approached him, said mm -hmm. we've been sent by our king, King John, mm -hmm. um, and he wants you to convert to our mm -hmm. religion, which is Christianity. Mm -hmm. And also we want to be able to build a big house, not a slave castle, we want mm -hmm. to be able to build this big house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Kwame is basically saying, well, mm -hmm. King Kwame, I, I mm -hmm. should say, is, mm -hmm. that is basically saying, well, no, we would prefer if you actually left, mm 
Mm-hmm. And yes, um, yes. he uses a particular, um, he says something that's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. And he says that friends who meet occasionally mm-hmm. better remain friends than if they are neighbours, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> which is mm-hmm. showing mm-hmm. you that he does mm-hmm. not want mm-hmm. a partnership mm-hmm. to take place. Yes. Um, the Portuguese refuse. Oh, absolutely, yes. And yes. they go ahead and build their castle, which we fort, later yes, know yes, to be yes, a, yes. A, a fort, a slave mm-hmm, dungeon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then King Kwame Ansa mm-hmm. gets his men to then go and attack mm-hmm, the Portuguese. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the Portuguese response to that is mm-hmm. to burn down their entire mm-hmm. village. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. So this idea of collaboration, I always questioned because uh, then what yes, happened yes, was yes. the Portuguese begin to rule Ghana. And yes, sometimes yes, I don't think yes. people or historians look yes, at it in yes, that sense yes, that this yes. country was colonized and these people yes. were being told I think what to do. The Portuguese experience, I think, is interesting because it's the country that really establishes the principle of colonization earliest in an African context. The European countries traded with settled in terms of forts, but didn't attempt really to settle in Ghana or colonize or any, any part of Africa. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so I would say yes, yes, the atrocities were there and there were often reminders because these forts were staffed not just by traders, but they were staffed by regiments <laughs> who were there for the precise purpose of going out on the march and fighting with the local people if something wasn't being enforced, a treaty that they understood hadn't been enforced in their own kind of, to their own benefit. So yes, we need to see these forts as military forts too. And that's why I said they're not just trading forts, but they are military forts. Yeah, yeah, because I, th- I think we have to be very clear that Africans, I do believe, didn't enter into this relationship as equal partners. And I think that's the idea that's always pushed. Yes. They were equal partners, various transactions yes. going on. Yes everybody happy at the end of the day and I don't <laughs> I don't no. actually uh well no I wouldn't say equal but I, I would say yes they were unwilling partners but not in the sense that as I said earlier that they recognized the necessity to, to acquire and the moment you don't produce as it were your iron age technology isn't capable of producing the guns that are required to fight your wars internally and wars that of course Europeans instigated <laughs> yes. then you do have to make some accommodation with, with Europe even to your own disadvantage yes 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 to acquire precisely that technology that allows it to defend yourself of course we'll come on later to the way which certain African leaders stood out against that yes yes King Kwame Ansa was the first yes of them okay. and he should be maybe one of the, yes. the heroes that celebrated Absolutely. June uh, Black History Month indeed and there are a number of others that we need to record and some of whom we've yes. forgotten about yes yes we well, had a lot of these um, European nations who would have considered themselves to be civilized. Um, mm-hmm. If you considered yourself to be civilized, how did the nations justify mm-hmm. capturing and then buying and selling people? Okay, well, we touched on the way in which I think the view of Africans changed mm-hmm. as Europeans became more heavily involved, as they shifted from just simply buying African gold, ivory, and so on to buying people. That, I think, must lead to a significant mental transformation, I think, in anyone's mind, when you actually come to treat people like this. But, okay, one, one of the interesting things is that, as I said all, is that we need to look at the way in which the justification for treating Africans as degraded people is already laid down by the way in which the church codifies, the, the way in which groups other than Europeans become involved in, as it were, that European kind of uh, project. Because I alluded back to the two documents, key significant documents, because but these are the things that define the way in which Europeans interact with Africans, or in fact Native Americans. Mm-hmm. Because the popes effectively more or less are saying that anyone who isn't a Christian can be subordinated to the rule of Europe, can be killed, can be attacked, Yes, the land taken away, and so on and so on. I can read you a specific passage from precisely the Doom Diversus in, in a moment, which touches on, on precisely that. We need to look at the way to which the Bible becomes annexed to this enterprise. Right. <laughs> you, know, you might say the Bible is a neutral a document. Well, no text is ever neutral. And we need to look at the, the way in which people systematically s- are set out to read particular verses in the Bible as a justification given, yes, by God, <laughs> yep. for the way in which Africans were cursed, or etc. and so on. There are people who've written about that. So we need to look at the way in which the Bible was in fact harnessed to that. But I can perhaps read you a short extract from the Doom Diversus. Yes. Okay, here's an interesting phrase from the Doom Diversus. Which is? Uh, the document that was in fact issued by the Pope in 1452. Yes. Okay. Which effectively legitimizes the trade 
in Africa and says that it's right f for you. They, you have no fear of your soul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your soul isn't in danger for doing something tremendously inhuman. Right. Yes? Okay. It says here, we by preceding letters had formally conceded with King Alphonse full and whole faculty to attack, conquer, overcome, reduce and subject all buckwheats. Buckwheats was the term then used for Africans, pagan and other enemies of Christ, wherever they are, within their kingdoms, duchies, properties. So wherever, what he's saying is that wherever you find Africans, mm -hmm. so long as they are what they call, quote-unquote, pagans, buckwheats, they have to be subordinated to the will of Europe. They have to be made use of. They have to be captured, he says here, conquered, exchanged against goods, and so on. And effectively, you have in those documents the full legitimation Yes, of the whole system that we now call a transatlantic slave trade. But that's the Pope there, you know, it's sort of like the highest level legitimising yes. the whole mm -hmm. idea of enslaving Africans. Mm -hmm. But wasn't there anyone in Europe at the outset perhaps saying, hang on, that doesn't sound right. Is of there any evidence of that? Absolutely. We can always find evidence of individuals who stood out against that. Uh -huh. Listen to how the past creates the legacy and living histories of today. Three continents, one history. On New Star Radio. When Don Silva Silva was someone who came from the Congo, he was in fact of mixed parentage. He specifically writes a long letter which he writes to both to the Pope, he writes to, to the Pope because he's contesting the Pope's <laughs> papal bulls. He also in fact goes to Lisbon, he tries to in fact engage with, if like, the King of Portugal to stop the trade. So in effect there are people who in fact are doing that. There are of course individuals and later to the Quakers, but even then the Quakers become very ambivalent because the Quakers were own ships to own everything. <laughs> yes, They were the ones who were own everything, but yet they were the ones who also wrote against the slave trade. In any age, individuals always stand out. Mm -hmm. The question is the volume of the voice. Yes, yes, most certainly, because you're talking about the time when basically it was, like you said, it was the church as an institution yes. in this country you had the royal family the royal um, family as one of the significant the most significant shareholders in the first slave trading company that was set up in this country by yes. charles ii um do you think that africans once they saw europeans coming onto their lands recognized that they were actually coming to war with them no i don't think africans understood that <laughs> i don't think they understood it because, because i said the initial contact between europeans and africans was a reasonably peaceful relationship insofar as it involved trading ordinary trade goods. Mm -hmm. Clearly Europeans were interested in getting hold of African gold mm -hmm. as they were interested in getting hold of gold that came from Central America and the Caribbean and so on, yes? Britain got involved with the slave trade quite a number of years after the Portuguese. Yeah. How did they join much later but then seem to go on to dominate the trade? Okay, I mean British involvement, let's try to pin that down. Officially, supposedly it starts in 1562. Mm. So effectively 121 years after the yep. Portuguese. Now in some ways it's not that surprising. We have to ask ourselves what's happening in Britain? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't Britain become involved earlier? And we need to understand the kind of the reformation that's actually going on in this country. In fact this country actually breaks away <laughs> from the Catholic Church. Yes, and in doing so it effectively rejects those papal bulls <laughs> yes. which had carved up the world yes right. in specific ways that benefited the portuguese and the spanish so all of that is pushed aside <laughs> you know under henry <laughs> and it now has effectively a free hand it now sees itself as having a free hand to really attack and uh, conquer precisely those territories which Spain and Portugal had claimed as their own. <laughs> yes. And of course, the first involvement, of course, is through piracy mm -hmm. and buccaneering. <laughs> this is how Britain becomes involved in the slave trade early, by people who, who go out as merchant adventurers. <laughs> you yes. know, the famous story of Hawkins and Raleigh, these are buccaneers. There is no, no British kind of Caribbean yet, yes. but they first of all attack the slave ships, they attack the, the gold ships coming back from Central America to, to Spain, precisely to reap the, the benefits and get the goods and to sell the slaves where they can because that's what they do they attack the slave ships get the slaves sell the slaves yes. so that sort of involvement is already there even before Britain goes into Africa and that is what they wanted a piece of every European country from henceforth after the mid 1600s wanted a piece of that action mm -hmm. okay so they came in late and they began to attack and yes um, okay they came in late now we need the second significant thing which we need to be paying attention to and you would say in order to understand the slave trade we need to understand the wars in Europe <laughs> because in the okay. in the 17th century what you have a series of wars wars over who will become king in Spain they often call the wars of succession in Spain between France Spain England Holland was then part of Spain and 
it's not settled until 1713 when you have the Treaty of Utrecht. Now, what's interesting about the Treaty of Utrecht is that it gives Britain, the Spanish, actually sell Britain effectively a royal contract. We often refer to it as the asiento. You might have heard that word, asiento. It's a key word because what they're doing is that they're giving a monopoly to the British to import into the Spanish territories 144,000 slaves a year. This is a significant impetus mm. to British expansion and involvement in the slave trade. Mm -hmm. The fact, because in some ways you have to be clear that if you trade in slaves, you have to sell slaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there must be some place where you can actually take them to market. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes? <laughs> and the British were hemmed in by the fact that they didn't have enough territories then. They had a few islands in the Caribbean, but the big territories like Cuba, you know, Haiti, Venezuela, all of these were owned by Spain, by you know, Mexico and so on. So they have to get access to the Spanish market the Brazilian market and that is what the Treaty of Utrecht actually really ushers in. It gives them control over that market and I think a key aspect of that of course is that out of the wars in Europe uh, Britain comes out of that dominant. Um, just to bank trying, one of the things that um, mm -hmm. but when we begin to talk about the transatlantic slave yes, trade yes. we often think that mm -hmm. this is the first time that Africa undergoes a enslavement period. Yes. Um, but actually we know that... It's the um, second phase perhaps, yeah. maybe even the third phase. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. Some yeah, people indeed. say the third and fourth yes, phase because yes. you had the Romans, exactly. you had the Vandals, yes. and you also had the Arabs themselves. You had the Arabs, yes, indeed, yes. How did Birmingham become a centre? How, how did Birmingham play an important role mm -hmm. in the transatlantic slave trade? Birmingham, I think, comes to I would say dominance, but certainly its interest in the slave trade grows at the start of the, uh, what, the 1700s. And that's when Birmingham moves from being really a small village, a hamlet of what, 20,000, 25,000 people, to by the end of the 18th century, about 75,000 people. So Birmingham actually undergoes a significant growth. But one of the interesting things about Birmingham is that you need to look at the English Civil War. You know, out of that English Civil War, <laughs> that what wars do is they create a demand for weapons. <laughs> mm. So Birmingham gets given, I think somewhere, as if I'm correct, in between the 1690s, it gets given a royal contract because you can't produce some things in this country unless you have a royal contract, a patent to produce something. Birmingham as a town gets given a royal contract to produce guns initially for the British army in this country, but increasingly for the African market. And in fact, in some ways, Birmingham comes to specialize in two kinds of guns. Quite often, in fact, made a bit differently in terms of the wood that was in fact used, beech and walnut. The beech gun was supposed to be for the African market, the walnut, the more expensive walnut for the European kind of market and so on. So Birmingham comes to be significant, a significant manufacturer in a rivaling London as a producer of guns. It's often said as we know that one slave equals one gun. <laughs> so Birmingham becomes a significant player, but I said not only in terms of guns, because we know that by the middle of the 18th century it's exporting something like 144,000 guns. But of course Birmingham is famous for, for other things, which is in fact the fetters, the shackles that actually ensure that the journey across the Atlantic is a safe one as mm. far as the whites are concerned, and you don't have too many revolutions and insurrections yes. on board ship, because you have to keep people shackled and manacled along that journey, but of course it didn't always prevent it. Three continents, one history. New Star Radio, 98.7 FM. Birmingham's number one community FM. <laughs> African nations, um, how did their leaders respond to the trading of Africans at the very beginning? What was their response? I think, I mean, as Anne Corby has said, that is that many were suspicious of any kind of relationship. And, you know, it's like the Greeks often had this phrase, beware of anyone bringing gifts. <laughs> anyone who brings gifts. It's like a Trojan horse. Outside, inside that gift is something which you don't know, yes? yes. So African leaders, like all good le leaders, you're suspicious of anyone who comes bearing a gift, <laughs> you know? And they were cautious. And, and what about the sentiments as time went on and it became more apparent what was happening? Well, as African leaders wised up, <laughs> I suppose is really how one can put it, as they wised up to the fact that Europeans didn't just simply want gold, they didn't just simply want ivory, uh, they didn't just simply want palm oil or whatever it was mm -hmm. they wanted. And in some ways this is in fact tied in with the fact that we have the Americas opening up because Europeans are in some ways content with that kind of trade. But then suddenly the possibility mm -hmm. of making profit in the Americas is really what transforms the relationship with, uh, with Africa. Because suddenly we do know that what the Americas does is that, well, they 
we've actually effectively what the Europeans do effectively that they kill off the, the, the labor force in <laughs> in Haiti in the Americas they get killed off by disease by overwork and so on that labor has to be replaced mm -hmm. and let's talk about some of the numbers because we can say yeah. these things and they can just kind of float by I understand that some 30 plus million yeah. um, native Americans were murdered by well, the Europeans. murdered killed by disease by war by labor yes and we know for example that uh, an island like Haiti, which supposedly, I think, at its initial, when Columbus arrived, had a population of roughly about 5 million. You know, within a century, you'd have less than 1,000 people left. Frankly, the word that we should be using is genocide. Mm. Yes, they were genocide. It is genocide. Against, a wholesale genocide against native peoples in the Americas. Awful genocide in which a whole people, you know, was wiped out in the Caribbean and in the Americas. And they're able to do this again, as you said earlier, yes. it's about the gun. The gun, the gun and is the, the, the what the differentiates the European, because it is what actually gives them the advantage, the technological advantage in warfare. How can someone do what has been done to Africans, to Native Americans, without any sense of what shame, any sense that what they were doing was a crime against humanity, which is really what we would now call it, mm -hmm. So how could actually people do this? And you see, that's why I say that I don't really want to belittle, let's say, the Jewish Holocaust. Yes. That's a significant kind of, of Holocaust. Yes. But what happened to Africans is a Holocaust which is really out of proportion in the sense that it didn't just simply last five years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this yes. went on for generations. How can someone over this extensive period of time do something to a people, a number, yes, different kinds of peoples, which actually degraded them, dehumanized them, which, for example, the, the philosophy for many planters in the Caribbean was that <laughs> you know, it's cheaper to buy someone than to have them live to age 40 or 50. Yes? So we come back then to the whole mentality that allowed that to happen. Right. The mentality of degrading people. And if we see the, Im the images of the, the initial capture, the, the journey across the Atlantic, the treatment in, in the Caribbean, each of these have their own specific Im images of degradation. And of people like, because it's not just a physical kind of degradation. I mean, that you, you one understands is the killing, the maiming, and everything, the leg yes. being cut off, everything. Yes. But we're talking here about, about more than that. We're talking here about the call, what you might actually call the uprooting of the African from his or her culture. Yes. The, you know, Patterson calls this well, he calls it the natal alienation. It's actually killing people socially. You kill them socially. Yes. You know, you, we need to look at the whole taking away of name. <laughs> what the symbolic importance of you mm. take away someone's name, you take away their language, you take away as much as you can. Of course, n not all gets taken away, but you yeah. take away as much as you can all of those manifestations of what makes a person a person. You take away their culture, their spiritual tradition. You, you give them some bastardized version of your own thing, Religion. of your own culture, which says that the white person is God in this context. Yes. Indeed. Let's go back um, to the African leaders. You were talking about earlier that there are certain African leaders at the time that mm -hmm. we should pay more attention to and, and talk about. Mm -hmm. Who were some of the African leaders who stood up at the time um, as people who were saying, basically, no, this, this can't happen? I mean, I suppose two or three f uh, figures come to mind. And if we deal with them in terms of the earliest kind of peers, King Afonso of the Congo, I mean, we shouldn't use that name because that's the name given to him by the Portuguese mm -hmm. that he might have adopted. Yes. His name wasn't King Afonso, but anyway, let's use that. That's yes. what he's known as to history as. But he w came to the throne in the Congo, what, around f early uh, 16th century. But he wrote, and he was literate, he wrote a number of letters which still exist to the King of Spain protesting at the slave trade that in fact people who had come as brothers were no longer brothers but were seeking to be masters in fact that is what he's saying here you come as brothers but you're trying to to be masters in my house you're trying to tell me how to run my laws when uh, how to run my country what laws i should be instituting in my country and above all what things i should be selling to you the other person who comes to mind within the same kind of region is of course queen nzinga she in fact of course comes to power in ndongo and uh, in some ways, we need to locate her in the kind of the kind of destabilization of the Congo, because Queen Nzinga's kingdom was in first, was initially a tributary kingdom to the Congo. That the Portuguese encouraged it to break away. <laughs> she comes to power in the destabilization that takes place in the 1620s, uh, rough, roughly 1624, uh, uh, and for 30 years or so, she leads a campaign against the slave trade. 
And it's really only with her death that the situation is in fact created whereby the Portuguese can in fact now, as it were, install their own puppet leaders in some of these places. So Queen Nzinga, I think, is a significant kind of figure. She's a powerful figure. She too, again, was literate. A number of her letters survive. And I wouldn't, of course, encourage listeners to really get into this kind of literature. Okay, okay, it's up to us to make that available. Yes. Now, those written by King Afonso, by Queen Nzinga, and of course, the Oba of Benin, he refused to sell his people. But of course, his refusal has to be counterbalanced by his ability to defend his own kingdom. Mm. You always have to bear it in mind. You, can, you can't stand out against anyone. <laughs> but the bottom line is that you have to defend yourself. Yes, yes. So those are that's maybe three key figures, three key African leaders. And of course, if we go to the East African coast, we'll perhaps find other parallel uh, leaders who stood out against the Arab and the Portuguese on, on the East African uh, coast. In looking at our, our history, mm-hmm. um, one of the things we tend to do, especially when trying to trace our links back to Africa, mm-hmm. we focus on the west coast of yes. Africa. Yes. Um, but is it fair to say that Africans were taken from across the continent, the entire continent, and brought across to the Americas? Absolutely. I think that's absolutely fair to say. Of course, clearly, yes, West Africa dominated numerically. I don't know what the, fi- the figures are, but maybe 80, maybe even 90 percent. But certainly a significant percentage would have come. And there are, if like, historical narratives that we, we use words in, I think, in the Caribbean, which, what, words which allude to people coming from Madagascar. I've forgotten what the precise term that we, we use in the Caribbean, but it's a word, a corrupted word that re- relates to people who came from places like, like Madagascar on the east coast of Africa. They've also found in some of the Caribbean um, mm-hmm. languages... Absolutely, Swahili words. Swahili words. Yes. And, you, and of course, there's, there's a lot of genetic work being done now that shows that, in fact, that the diverse genetic pool from which we came in Africa, not just West Africa, even though the focus tends to be on, let's say, Ghana or Nigeria and so yes. on, but as I said, that many people, many African leaders on, on the coast didn't trade their own people. <laughs> they traded people who'd been captured in the wars, and quite often people would have travelled a thousand miles <laughs> before actually arriving at Elmina. <laughs> Can you imagine that? A thousand a miles? A thousand miles, and the mortality rate along the way, held in barracoons as they travelled to the coast in the hot sun, yes. tied to a baobab tree or whatever it was, yes. the mortality was horrendous. Yes. It was horrendous. Looking at Songhai and Mm-hmm. Mali, mm-hmm. Africans were also taken as slaves mm-hmm. from those regions mm-hmm. because if you look in America today, they yes. can trace the blues music right back right to Mali. Right back to Mali, yes, southwest Mali, I think it comes from, yes. yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. we had Africans being taken from those great empires. Absolutely, from those empires, yes. Because every time an, an empire de- declines, disappears quite often as a result of war, what you have is chaos. <laughs> yes. Those are, if like, the wonderful conditions for slave trading. Mm-hmm. <laughs> chaos is what <laughs> yes, leads to slave trading. And of course, that's when the kingdom fragments into ten small states. Those are the ideal conditions in which people of those former empires, in fact, can be taken. And there are, in fact, wonderful narratives of people. I've read, some of you might know the story of, uh, his name was, I think, Mohammed Kaba, but I'm not too sure. Yes, but, yes, yes. But he actually came from Timbuktu. He came from a little village from Timbuktu. He was in Jamaica until, what, 1834. I think he actually went back to Jamaica after 1834. Oh. He went back to Jamaica. But he came from an ulama family. He was literate in the Quran and so on and so on. But, and he, but he could actually tell you exactly where he'd come from. He'd come from a place near Timbuktu. He'd been given, of course, another name called Robert Pitt. <laughs> His name taken away, but he still remembered it. And, of course, many people did. And there are, in fact, wonderful stories of people who actually knew exactly where they had come from, depending yeah. on the period, of course, that they had, you know, the generations that they had, in fact, lived in the Caribbean and so on. Three continents, one history on New Star Radio. Our brothers and sisters were taken thousands of miles, places that we don't even know. So it's really saying, let's, let's make links again with that kind of history of our brothers and sisters in a thousand miles apart, five thousand miles apart. Yeah. Okay. Um, going back, um, mm-hmm. as Ebony was um, asking mm-hmm. you earlier about mm-hmm. the African leaders, mm-hmm. what about the general population in Africa at that time? Did they uprise against what some of their leaders, yeah. rise up, shall I say, against what some of yeah. their leaders were actually doing? Absolutely. I think history has, uh, tells us that there was often a very sharp difference of opinion. Because and one way, maybe to look at precisely that point, is to look, there are interesting stories that have come down to us of slave ships been moored in the Calabar region and of course where slaves had already been captured by you know and been sold by the leaders but local population in fact <laughs> attacking those slave ships so in fact history tells us they disagreed violently sometimes yes. with the policies of their leaders to sell off mm-hmm. people who might have been their own kin 
Yes. And so a friend of mine has been doing some work on what is called the Lloyd's List. The Lloyd's List is really like the kind of the insurance company. Yes. <laughs> when people put in a claim about you know how the ship had been damaged and the merchandise lost. <laughs> What's interesting in terms of that is that how many of those kind of so-called insurrections took place even before the slave ship had actually left Africa. <laughs> and in those insurrections, many local people were involved in trying to free people who had been captured. So there are a lot of stories which we need to, yes, collate and really tell that story of mm -hmm. the way which local populations didn't always agree with their leaders. And in fact, as we, is in this country, local people don't agree with leaders. Mm -hmm. Yet leaders do things in the name of people. And yeah. sometimes these are at variance with what local people actually would want because the local people are the ones who actually have to bear the brunt of these policies. Yes. It's not the leaders. Okay, um, we're coming to the end of the show um, yes. now. Um, last week we touched upon... Um, Songhai, the fall of Songhai in yes. Mali in ancient Ghana. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. After Songhai went, that was the last time. The last African big people, empire. Yeah. The last big Because we have to understand that Songhai is a massive. We're talking here, but really it's almost the size of Europe. Yes, <laughs> you know, yes, we have to yes. get some sense. Songhai isn't, you know, Britain, France. It's all of those countries roll into one. Yes. And we need to be asking ourselves how administratively can if like rulers actually manage to yes acquire an empire and maintain it over centuries yes without some of the significant technological developments <laughs> of communication that we now come to take for granted today yes 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 but it those were in fact as you said quite rightly the last of the big empires in africa after that you have of course other smaller kingdoms did the slave trade mm -hmm. prevent any other um, african empires or kingdoms from rising up? Was it the slave trade that put a halt to that? You can speculate about this, but clearly, as I said, it's not so much the slave trade, I think, as such, but as I said, it's the civil strife yes. that is created with the involvement of Europeans between African countries. The empire of Mali was what we, we might loosely now call a multicultural <laughs> kind of empire. It was many peoples, yes? How did Africans manage what we now see as problematic, the problem of living together while being different. Yes, we'd have to look at the involvement of Europeans, I think. We'd also have to pay attention to the rise of Islam yes. and the impact that had had on the region in terms of creating the internecine warfare between countries that weren't Islam. But as Islam spread, of course, it creates another set of battles, <laughs> and a, yes. another set of, yes, of, of issues that yes. have to be resolved in an African context. So I think the issue is actually quite complex. This is the European involvement in festering <laughs> strife using the gun and other means yes between african leaders is the spread of islam to west africa and of course the moroccan conquest isn't just simply a moroccan conquest an arab conquest it's a it's an islamic conquest it's part of an islamic expansion so basically you're saying there that the, you know it's more of a indirect perhaps relationship between well, I think it's direct because selling guns, you know, guns are never neutral. Today we sell guns, guns create refugees. That's, a, for me, a direct relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, we might pretend that we don't want to know how guns are going to be used. And mm -hmm. in that sense, it's indirect. We claim we don't sell the guns to fire. Yes. <laughs> and of course, many Birmingham guns blow up in your face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they were so badly made. The ones sold to Africans were often very badly made, yes? They fired once and they didn't fire again. <laughs> And there was a victim at the end of the, <laughs> so the, the person who fired it was the victim. <laughs> and when looking at the transatlantic slave trade, how did it destroy yeah. Africa? How did it affect Africa? I think a variety of ways. I mean, I think we you've touched on the one about the way in which it sort of impeded yes. the growth in terms of the development of states and rivaling perhaps the old Songhai, Mali kind of kingdoms. That's the first thing that I think it does. It prevents the kind of the natural process of what you might call unification that might have occurred within Africa. You know, in Africa there were existing trade routes across the Sahara and other and whole parts of Africa. And many of those trade routes would have been unified by, let's say, the Hausa language, as the language of communication, as the way that English now performs globally, the language of communication. So in effect it sort of undercuts, cuts off really and at its knees, the, the development within Africa of a kind of a, kind of a language, <laughs> a lingua franca, yes. that could unify African countries. And today, of course, we have the same problem. African countries are saying to us, well, it's easier to speak French and English <laughs> yes, <laughs> than to promote one of our local languages as the national language, because it would lead to strife, other groups would. But yet, historically, some languages, Swahili in East Africa, as you mentioned, Hausa, and other languages in, in West Africa, did serve to become at least a commercial language. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Yes, that allow different societies to trade, you know, 
But you also have, with the advent of the slave trade, you have yeah. loss of culture, less, loss of technical... L loss of culture, yes. is the whole loss of, let's say, the, the metallurgical skills yes. that countries like, <laughs> as it were, Benin, had developed to a very high, le high, high level. In fact, one of the interesting things, about when the Portuguese first came to Africa, one of the things that they were keen to acquire from Africa was, in fact, the artifacts. We shouldn't forget that. It's African artifacts that, you know, the metallurgical goods, the statues, the, and so on, that they were very keen to make for a European market. Now, clearly, that loss was a very significant one because that that skill of met that metallurgical skill could easily have been translated into the gun making skill. It, it was the same yeah, skill. Yeah. It was the same skill. But I think the work of people like Thornton is also interesting for one other point because if we go back to the kind of what I call civil strife and warfare, let's relate it to something that our listeners today can in fact understand. Angola and M Mozambique in the civil wars of 20, 30 years ago. Yes. Now, what we know about c civil wars is that what happens is that the people flee. Millions of people flee from Angola, they flee to Zambia, or the Mozambicans flee to, uh, to what is then Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. So what happens <laughs> is that you have land, unoccupied agricultural land, <laughs> yes. which isn't being used productively. So, and Thornton's work looks at precisely what he calls that process in Angola. Angola becomes a desert, it, not a, a literal kind of desert, but a desert in the sense of land lying waste that could have been used to feed the people. And that's why I think if you look at people like Rodney, Rodney's work is significant not only in looking at the number of people in fact taken in Africa, but the way which the African population in relation to other continents stagnates. It doesn't grow. Over, let's say, between 16, 15, 18, uh, fi uh, 50, when the European populations, when the population of Europe and Asia is literally doubling, <laughs> Africa remains stagnant because initially it's lost its labor force, it's lost the ability to produce the food to feed itself because of the point I was just making about the wasteland of Angola and so on. Of course, you allude to the issues of culture, the significant issues around culture and so on that actually underpin. Chancellor Williams talks about it in his book, this yes. The Destruction of uh, Black Civilization. Yes. And he talks about people, because they're fleeing, you have refugee problems, as you talked about yeah. earlier. Yes. He says people now have to go and live in swamplands because you're, they're trying yeah. to get as far as way as possible and from your being first, captured. Your first priority in that situation is survival. It's not <laughs> culture. <laughs> culture comes when you have time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes? Most and time and food surplus. <laughs> and of course, when you have um, archaeologists and European travellers going back to Africa mm -hmm. and they see people living in some of the most destitute and situations. Absolutely. They don't relate it back they don't to, relate the, it the, to the other trade. to the other Africa. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, and they're not relating yeah. it to the slave trade to say, well, yeah. they now live like this absolutely. because of what happened back yeah. then. That, they say yeah. this is how you always This is how were. they they will always live like that. And that's why I said really when we talk about the need to remember, we often think that sometimes it's like we have two things. Remember, we can either remember or we can forget. <laughs> but yes. my argument is that really it's not... The opposite of remembering isn't forgetting. The opposite of remembering really is what I call disinformation. <laughs> okay. Because in that void which memory doesn't fill, other people fill it with their own stories, yes, of their own slant. They give you disinformation. They tell you a story, let's say, of abolition, which is really only about the last day of the 245 years <laughs> <laughs> that Britain traded in Africans. And they say, let's celebrate the last day yes. <laughs> of that 245 years. Let's don't talk about the, uh, yes, the other <laughs> hundreds of years. <laughs> but okay. let's celebrate the last day. And if we get involved in celebrating that last day, then we are forgetting our history. Most certainly. My point, of course, is that history is actually extremely important and in each of these things that I think we want to be presenting to you as a listener really is mm -hmm. to tease out for you, I think, the lessons from history that we need to come out of that one, that people struggled, they fought, and we need to be understand how did they fight, what tools did they use for fighting, can we actually learn the lessons from their own kind of struggles. And I think that's really the key for me is to have the history but have the lessons from history of how people struggle. Find out how people did things. They did things. They didn't just simply have a history. <laughs> but that history was about making, doing something, fighting for something, carrying out action. It's about action.
we've looked at now how we ought to um, mm -hmm. inform ourselves and mm -hmm. perhaps how best once we've learned um, to mm -hmm. actually commemorate because you talked about 1807 yes. and you know with the mm -hmm. um, commemorations going on mm -hmm. it should mean something slightly different mm -hmm. perhaps when you go back and you have your own experience of mm -hmm. learning about mm -hmm. what happened and remembering those lessons mm -hmm. and perhaps using them to empower yourself you absolutely yeah? yes I mean I think that's important I mean okay to start off with I would say well when we have dates like 1807, we need to have a whole series of other dates. <laughs> mm, yes. So we might actually talk about 1506 and King Afonso mm, <laughs> and, yes. and his letters. We might talk about Queen and Zinger in 1624, but significantly as Caribbean peoples, we would in fact talk about, let's say, the Haitian experience. Because I think... In 1804? 1804, which I think as a people in this country, we fail miserably i think to mark mm. there were people who did it in liverpool who in fact marked the 200th anniversary because well, let's look at as i said that other anniversary that other big anniversary the haitian independence the the first successful attempt <laughs> of africans in the caribbean to overthrow their european masters and claim for themselves the same principles that they were fighting for in Paris. <laughs> Liberty, equality, fraternity. Well, it's now, yes, it's, it's not just fraternity, yes, but sisterhood and so on, yes. So they were very successful in claiming for themselves. Or we would be doing them a tremendous disservice, our ancestors there, if we forget the significant struggles that they actually engaged in. Yes, in 80, between, and in fact, it didn't take one year, it took, <laughs> what, 13 years. You know, from 1791 to 1804 before they were able to get their freedom. That's a long time. Yes. They yeah. didn't just struggle once, but they kept struggling over again. And they came back. You lost the battle, but you won the war. Yes. Uh, and perhaps that's a, a lovely lesson there. You can see there the persistence. The persistence. You know what I mean? You have an aim and you persist. You know, you might do something once. You don't give up after failing you don't, once. You don't, you don't give up. And there's up. some interesting lessons to go back and learn about. Yes. I think. And I think there's one le lesson to which perhaps I want to leave with, because since I come from what I call you know, a background where education for me has always been important, <laughs> I mean, one of the lessons that I think I really want to tease out of, let's say, the Jamaican Rebellion of 1831-32, often referred to as the Sam Daddy Sharp Rebellion, is the importance that Sam attached to being able to read, mm. you know? As he was, a, as you know, so called a leader in the church, but for him, re literacy was the key to his ability to communicate with people across the western part of Jamaica mm -hmm. and to get 20,000 people, <laughs> you know, out in their own non initially non violent way, just sitting down in cane fields, saying that after Christmas, we're not working for you again mm -hmm. unless you pay me. And for him, I think the book. Maybe it was with the Bible back then, but reading the book, literacy was for him a key to that success of spreading the message. You can't fight a battle unless you can communicate, <laughs> you know, what you're trying to communicate. And we need to remember Sam Sharp, I think, in this aspect. Dr. Clive Harris, thank you ever so much for taking okay. the time out to okay. share your knowledge with us. We yes. appreciate it very much. Okay, thanks, and hopefully you'll have me back again. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> most certainly, most certainly, uh, particularly when we come to talk about the regiments. Okay, great. Well, it's great to have been with you, Ebony and Amcobia. Thank Thanks you very again. much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, folks, we're here every Tuesday from 7 till 8 p.m. All right, this is your history lesson here on New Star Radio <laughs> every Tuesday from 7 until 8 o'clock. All right, class starts at 7. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll see you next week. Take care. Good night. Three continents, one history. Restitching the threads that bind the city of Birmingham, Africa, and the Caribbean. Three continents, Three continents one, history. one history. From Africa through the Caribbean to Europe, we take you on a journey of the transatlantic slave trade. Three continents, one history. We reconnect the people, events, cultures, societies and heritage of the three mighty continents. Africa, the Americas, Europe. We invite you to engage with over 500 years of history and meet the men and women that shaped and changed the world forever. Marcus Garvey, Nanny of the Maroons, Yara Sandy Listen to how the past creates the legacy and living histories of today. Three continents, one history on New Star Radio. Three continents, one history. Join the Three Continents, One History radio show 
Only available on New Star Radio every Tuesday from 7 to 8 p.m. Greetings, massive. This is Freddie McGregor, and you're tuned into New Style Radio, the biggest thing in Birmingham, 98.7 FM, and we run the thing. You hear me?